we are here. Nothing we are happened. the convergence, and we are recording. Okay. Yeah. Now let me introduce you know all the participants here today. Kara, Comrade Storm. Now she well, is. I am name fluid, so I have yes. two names. I like it, Comrade Storm. Yes, it's like the uh, like the uh, you know Hamas uh, military uh, a code name for the October the seventh. Uh, the um, Alexa the, Storm. Yes, yes, yeah, Storm is yeah. in it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, Storm the way it? You tell us. Well, it comes from um, when I looked into what my name means. My favorite definition is the Cornish one, which is um, I didn't choose my spelling to be Cornish. I just kind of like the way the letter like, K looks at the start of the name. It's like kind of verbose, and I'm a bit of a verbose little shit. Birth um, name? Um, uh, no, my birth name's some awful crap, but uh, Kara um, uh, is my transition, you know, as my actual name. Um, but Storm come across when I was looking up other parts of its history, and I was like, "Oh, Carter is a famous Valkyrie um, from the the Norse religion, the Norse canon, and uh, she was known as the Wild and Stormy One." And I'm like, "Well, fuck, damn, does that describe my ass?" Pretty yeah. cool, honestly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Andrew is from Tennessee. How do you say <laughs> Tennessee properly? You know, I, I I'm sure I mispronounced it. How, do you, how does a Tennessean say Tennessee? Actually, I'm from Michigan originally and oh. uh, moved here when I was 11, but I just call it Tennessee. Okay, Isn't that like that's... most people from Tennessee? <laughs> Pretty much. Um, Pretty much. We're in Michigan. Okay. Flint, in Michigan. Michigan. There's a lot of like Midwesters out in, the, in like Tennessee and all that. Like. It was I'm Michigan from... that decided the last... Uh, uh, the, the 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 previous from the last election was decided by Michigan. When Trump uh, got elected, it was Michigan that was the deciding state. I remember. I'm from Flint, Michigan, where the le the water is full of lead. Oh yeah, I know Flint, Michigan. That's where the uh, auto industry was located. There used to yes. be uh, there used to be a, a very militant you know labor movement in Flint, Michigan. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is that in Macomb County? It's in Genesee County. See. Okay. Mark, you're too far away from the microphone. We can't hear you well okay. enough. Okay, sorry. Okay, very I'm good. Here now. Yeah. Um, okay, Mark, and where are you from? I am origin. I was born in a hospital that no longer exists, uh, a do doctor's hospital in Manhattan. Okay, we know you came from your mother, you know, but I mean, like, what geographical location are you uh, uh, acquainted York with? New York well, City. I, yes, I've lived, all, I've lived all over the United States. Yeah. Okay. Me, same thing. I've lived in Toronto. I was raised in Toronto. Yeah. I I, I made a lot of trouble in Ottawa, and uh, yeah. and I came to Montreal here to finish my doctorate. And I've lived in Nablus, Palestine, as well. And I'm going back because Nablus um, is best. Nablus is fabulous. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, have I invite situation. you all to come and visit when we have a guest house there. Oh, I have that situation of being like, you know, torn away from the places I should be, you know, like I'm, I am Celtic and of English heritage. I don't throw shade on that, but like, oh, yes, you miss saying so. It. Yes. You um, know, you, the I, I am trapped in the, I'm trapped in England. It's not a nice place to be if you're Celtic. Um, wow. like, depending on which part of England you're from, it's not a nice place to be if you're English, <laughs> speaking for huh. the Northern Brethren, but like... <laughs> but you do have a great Palestinian flag right behind you with the red, you know, V, you know, pointing right to your head. Yes. Watch out, though. Hamas videos, you know, when they have a, a red triangle like that above a head, you know, that means you're a target. Oh, oh my, <laughs> am I, like, it's like a red dot site or something, you know, uh, like... Yeah, 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 laser dot, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mean that would that would but be here it the doesn't IDF, count. though, wouldn't it? Like, because the idea for the ones that go around doing mindless assassinations while our Palestinian yeah. heroes go and capture hostages so that they can save thousands, if not millions, of Palestinian brethren that are locked inside prisons. Yeah. So yeah. you know, yeah, but I don't see no red dots from Palestine. You know, yeah, but the, but the um, you know the Zionist snipers are now being sniped by Palestinian snipers who built their own I mean, rifles. You know. With the long barrels, you know those sniper barrels. You know, like they do you have remember the. Do you remember the the Afghan British war? 
um, the one in the was it the 1800s, 1870s? Okay? No, I'm not that. I'm not old enough. <laughs> uh, I, I, okay, I don't mean I don't mean I don't mean literally, but like um, oh, uh, okay. the the British, they were beaten by Afghanis uh, about 1.5 kilometers with fucking muskets. Wow. They call it the Great Game, from what I've heard. Uh huh. Yeah, it's the graveyard of empires. The British and the Russian yeah. empires who were trying to fight each other at this point in time. Uh -huh. This wasn't when they were getting along. This was when they wanted to kill each other so that mm. they could control Ukraine and the Caucasus, respectively. Um, mm. uh, they literally agreed to say that Afghanistan exists as a wall between their empires because of how mighty and powerful their empires are. They must be split by this graveyard of such. Mm. Little bitches, like little bitches, got their ass whooped, and they have to be like, "We are so mighty and grand, we must not cross the Afghan. We'll destroy each other." And it's like, no, you'll get cooked by a bunch of Afghan farmers with muskets. They that's were. They were that's what's uh, happening in Gaza muskets. now. The Zionist military is being chopped into little pieces. I hope yeah. so. Yeah. I hope that continues. Oh, well, they're going to try and start a fight with Hezbollah now. Does anyone remember what happened the last oh, time they oh. tried to start a fight with Hezbollah? We're like... Oh, brutally. God, and the United how, States how many is thousands announced. of them got fucking punked by like a, like 9,000 like Hezbollah soldiers? Like <laughs> It sounds like you're looking forward to uh, to a confrontation between the two, you know, like a like a fighting match, you know, like let's watch, let's see what happens, you know. I, I'd and rather they stay the fuck out. Your favorite, and I think that you your bet is good, you know, because, uh, you know, they've got 150,000, you know, missiles ready, ready to go, you know, against, uh, like, you know, uh, against, you know, Tel Aviv. Against you yeah. know, and, and they probably you know got guidance systems you know and they can target you know the house of Netanyahu if they wanted to you know. Well, there's major flaws with the yeah. Iron Dome that they don't tell you about. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, the Iron problem. Dome system, you know, like it's not going to work for them. Do you know, it, it gives the, work the, the uh, against Iran it's either, as, as as the United States claims in, in Israel. Yeah. Well, do you know, there's um uh, the the guidance system causes cancer for the people who operate it. Like um, so, the, the 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 that purity fascism culture that they're breeding in the Jewish people and the eugenics that we've heard yeah. from the Israeli community. I hope they know what radiation does to that supposed purity they're trying to fucking protect. Like I, th th these people are like fascists are so easy to get under the skin of because just like, Ooh, your, your purity is, is being tampered with. The, Do you the, mean like that, they're the, using uh, depleted uranium as uh, as armaments? No, as, it's the as, radiation from it is cancer causing. Um, the, the, the radiation, the radio from radiation, what? the you, radio you radiation, magnetic radiation. It is causing. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow! But it's that yeah strong. because of the kind of the type of radar system they're using is probably like unshielded. Uh -huh. So like it just it's just dirty as fuck. Also, um, not all the rockets are actually functional rockets. They just kind of blow up in the sky, hmm. which made it look spectacular, so that they can trigger it if they really want to and make it look like they're fighting off more than they actually are. Uh. Yes, Andrew. The thing is about people who are obsessed with uh, genetic and racial purity, they all end up inbreeding at the end of the day. <laughs> yes. That's the British Trump card. Like, talk about how pure they are compared to the Irish while they're fucking their own cousin. Yeah. Yeah, I once saw an article in, it was in the evening, uh, a report in Fox News even, that, uh, you know, black Americans have a stronger gene pool than white Americans because they are more diversified than white Americans. Therefore, you know, that they are, they have healthier bodies, <laughs> are going to live longer and probably, uh, you know, uh, evolve better than, you know, the whites. So, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's quite it's true. Almost like there's a reason why there's Mesopotamian pottery in Cornwall. You know, like we had connections with all these parts of the world for like absolutely ages, and Celtic people in Cornwall absolutely traded with uh, the proto Arabs of Mesopotamia. Oh, uh huh. There, there is a place that uh, near where I lived one time, uh, Wise, Virginia, in the Appalachian Mountains, a town called Pound, about 10 miles away, uh, where almost everyone had the same last name. <laughs> and it was a, uh, a big problem with people called the Blue People. And I had some of them as my students. They they literally had a, a blue tint to their skin because of inbreeding. Wow. 
Wow. Well, I didn't know that. Know, like, the Jewish practice of uh, of marrying cousins, you know, also has the consequences. And that's why there are certain sort of, you know, genetic traits that are particular, you know, to Jewish people, like, uh, what is it? Is that t- would Tay-Sachs disease be? Yeah, hmm. I think that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, who knows what so, the English have done to themselves of inbreeding? We'll find that out down the line. I went wow, to the, the royal now. family, yeah. <laughs> Although I guess that's where it's just um, uh, Charles's like cancer sausage fingers come from. I mean, that's a real big sign that his bum hole's going to go bad. But oh. um, oh, that one oh. a heart issue. Yeah, <laughs> this is like uh, the uh, Czar oh, Nicholas uh, and his hemophilia. Oh, yes, yes. Sounds but, you know, um, in Appalachia, where I live, the more inbred families you'll find. Yeah, but that's the English, uh, you know, the Scots-Irish, we're doing okay. Hmm. <laughs> well, I know we have a problem with that too. But it's oh, fun yes. to talk on the English. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, talking about the English, uh, we'll find out if the English have got any congenital issues from their inbreeding when they stop inbreeding. we we, we got to get to that point first, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to be a crossroad. Well, the Winter family is originally German, isn't it? Um, Who? When the Windsors. Are, the or... Windsors, um, yeah, they're a weird amalgamation of like Germans, Scots Germans, mm-hmm. um, and uh, like Anglo's to a certain degree. Like mm. they technically have lineage to Alfred the Great. Mm. Okay. Mm. Hey, I want to know that you're know, predominantly German. Andrew, that you're wearing a talus. Let's see the, uh, the the the. Uh... The, uh, can you raise raise the talus? You know, we have to see the bands. Oh, yes. It's also got this symbol on it, if you could see it. Oh, what yes. The, the tablets. Yeah, the commandments. And, yeah. and I guess it has the fringes on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. it has uh, the fringes. Yep. Yeah, I that like it. I haven't right seen that style it. before. Oh, wow, two colored. Oh. My Hebrew the back. And and the kafia, you know, there's a relationship between the kafia that Kara is holding up and the talus, you know, because if you look, there's one of the symbols, you know, like the bands there represent, you know, Canaan as the pathway, the roadway with two uh, wheels, you know, uh, cartwheels, you know, running along the side of it. You know, that's what that is, you know. And if you look at the talus, can you lift it up? My talus yeah. has the same thing. And your talus has similar but you don't have the two um, you know wheels you know wheel lines going through your your bands there but mine does yeah so that's uh there's you know that even that you know like i try to point I out see. you know to some zionists you know i go to demonstrations in palestine wearing a talus and one time we got stopped by the military and some settlers came down you know and some of the settlers you know they were they had tzitzes you know they were wearing tzitzes they were you know orthodox religious yeah. so i said to them you know look at my talus here you see this you know band it's just like a talus isn't it and and, and they just stood and, and looked you know they we were afraid to say anything and i said this is my talus do you understand <laughs> and they just you know and all of a sudden you know like all their you know vicious brutal brutal mentality will sort of you know wipe clean you know they couldn't um, say anything you know, they didn't know what to say, but they knew that I was right. I see it important that where and when I can to be seen wearing this out and about as a show of the Palestinian, you know, like symbolism of their of their people. This is the the kafir is one of the most like important like cultural sort of representations of what Palestine means to both Palestinian Arab, uh, Palestinian Muslims and Palestinian Jews, and just the, the Palestinian history, especially in regards to the Arab context of it, um, means uh, this is a really important symbol. And so while Palestine's under siege, we should really be showing the 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 symbols of the people of Palestine everywhere and where we go. You shouldn't just be, t- like, protest shouldn't be the only place where you're willing to, like, you know, be a little it, different yeah. than you'd normally mm-hmm. be uh, mm-hmm. and do this. And oh my God, is it a beautiful symbol of solidarity to, to sort of be like this? And people are going to ask questions. People are going to think about it. And it's mm-hmm. a verbose matter. It means you're taking the, the angle of Palestinian solidarity further than just street protests. 
Yeah. It's, it's the sorry, symbols are very an ancient, you know, like thousands of years. You know, I've mentioned one of the symbols on the on the Kufiya, you know, which is the roadway with the two wheel uh, tracks, you know, going alongside of it. The next one in the center is a fishing net. You know, that's a fishing net because, you know, the, you know they, they live on the Mediterranean. That's the fishing net. No, yep. that's the olive tree. Those are olives, olive, olive leaves. Those are, yeah. you know, made like olive leaves. It's the one above it, you know, that is the fishing net. Wow. Yes, above it, there's another pattern. Nice, very nice, very nice. Yeah, there we go. That's it. That's the fishing net pattern. Yeah, that's the one, yeah, with the big black dots. That's where the knots are, you know, where the fishing net is, is knotted, you know, to, and then, yeah. So fishing, okay. olive trees, and, uh, you know, transport and uh, passageway, you know, those are the three sort of main features of uh, Canaan. Uh, yeah, you can and, see all three of them now. And it's still it's still that way, you know, except that the Zionist military won't let them do fishing anymore off Gaza. They get shot and killed. Is it true that the Yiddish language is banned in the state of Israel? Pretty well, yeah. It's not an official language. Arabic is an official language of Israel, but not Yiddish, you know? I mean, it's, not, it's not banned in the sense people can speak it. If they want to yeah, speak. you can speak it. It's just they're not going to accommodate your ass. Like, yeah, it's not taught in the school system. There's no Yiddish taught in the school system at all. None. It's a great way to punk the the, the Israelis, though. You know. Like, yeah, but Arabic, you know, is an option. You can take Arabic as an option in in the Hebrew educational system, <laughs> but not Yiddish. The other thing, like Yiddish, was what like helped the Jewish culture survive. It has that kind of like air of importance to it and it's like history as much as it's beautiful that hebrew was restored like absolutely beautiful beyond belief rejoice but like yiddish is so goddamn important to the history of jewish survival in regards to and more like, than that culture. yiddish is the working class language the upper class didn't speak yiddish right exactly it was like our secret code did the upper yeah. class speak aramaic aramaic no that the top Christians, uh, some of the Christian sects, and uh, and also the the Druze in uh, Syria and Golan Heights, they speak Aramaic. Yeah. Within the context of the Russian Empire, where my ancestors come from, it was illegal, I'm pretty sure of. To speak Yiddish? Yeah, wasn't it? I Under Zarnikos the second. Well, in, in public, probably, yeah. Oh yeah. dear, no, you're on about when the pogroms really like uh, like heated up after the release of the the uh, what was it the you know, the articles of the nations of Zion um that oh, that wow. did lead to a, a sort of like banning of the Jewish like language and culture essentially it was kind of it was the prototype for Nazi Germany yes uh, and after the assassination of the Tsar, you know the Jewish communities were were targeted as a retaliation. As and well before that, Jewish. the pogroms at Easter time always happened, you know, for thousands of years by Christians, you know, when they were blaming Jewish people for the crucifixion of uh, yes. Yehoshua ben Yusuf, uh, Jesus Christ. And they would target the Jewish community for that, even though it was the Romans who did it, you know. So, I mean, even uh, the book tells you the Romans that did it, but they managed to, like, blame someone. They went, like, they, they, I can't believe the story about Judas. I don't think that's true, like, because, like, what like the guy that jesus trusted the most all of a sudden got offered a bag of gold even though he was the guy who was trusted to manage the the gold he was the only one who was allowed to manage the gold for the the disciples uh, none of the others were allowed to touch it so like if he wanted to run away with money he could have done it ages ago but all yeah. of a sudden one bag of gold and he's like oh time to sell off my people sounds like an anti-semitic stereotype not gonna lie it really yeah. pisses me off yeah the program that and i'm also familiar i'm sorry What's that? No, no, go on. The pogrom that I'm most familiar with within the Russian Empire was the one in 1905 that had my relatives fled, uh, flee rather. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would be that the. Day. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. 1905. You know, it was the Bund that was most uh, street active in, uh, in, in, um, where was it, Petrograd or Moscow, that they were Petrograd. fighting off the fascists. And uh, that's what, uh, 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 you know, ignited the uh, revolution of 1905, 
Was You're referring the, uh, to the Petrograd Soviet. That yes, won, that's it. Um, yeah, it was uh, after the worker peasant uh, uh, march on Moscow, there was then the Petrograd uprising. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Going back What's to it? The, but, what has always, always, always concerned me about the Druze is that in Israel the, the Druze are very, very Zionist. I mean, I mean they, I mean they even fight in the IDF. Now, I've never understood what what the, I mean. The Druze religion is basically a, a branch of Shia Islam, a heretical uh, somewhat branch of Shia Islam. But why would they be Zionists? I, I've never understood that. But I that's know they, that's uh, secondary. You know, like the Druze, you know, are, are fucked up basically, and yeah, uh, they Zionist. they want to assimilate into the uh, dominant, you know, and uh, privileged culture, and they because go to the military of... in order to get a promotion. And they're and they do worse things than even you know the the Jewish Zionists you know do you know they're the you know there was a Druze soldier who actually shot my friend Tom Hurdle you know the volunteer with the ISM from two thousand and three he's the one who got shot in the head in Rafa by a no, Druze uh, by sniper at that time yeah doesn't it kind anyway. of depend, doesn't it kind of depend which side of the heights we're talking about when it comes to the Druze because like some of them are more towards the side deciding with Surya um, yes the ones in Surya on. yeah mm -hmm. yeah because but uh, uh, um, they are a distinct nationality so that makes four nationalities there you know uh, not just well, the Surya is a mess but like different like national groups and problems like uh, this way i've kind of found it weird when everyone like unanimously got uncritical about assad and i'm like he was actually like massacring like well uh and like using chemical weapons at one point on the kurdish i agree that's and, what i, I think and the, i know the, that you know um, because he had it? the chemical the, weapons the Assyrians. And yeah and the yeah, and yeah. the assyrians and then like um you know the kurdish ended up also genociding assyrians too i swear assyrians always get caught up in the worst parts of like uh like genocide in west asia and then no one ever talks about them and it gets me really upset yes I've okay, but anyway and keep keeping about palestine you know we're, we're talking about palestine here not syria the fourth uh nationality in palestine are the bedouin there's the bedouin druze uh, yes. you know uh, jewish israelis and 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 Palestinians, who are themselves, you know, composed of both Muslims and Christians, and, and many Jews. of whom were originally Jewish, Israelites. You well, know, well, no, they're, they're also comprised of Jewish people, too. Um, like, there's Jewish Palestinians. Oh, yes, so. there's Jewish Palestinians as well. Yeah. You know, like uh, Dr. E. Davis, myself, and then the uh, the Hasidim of Naturi Karta and the Meir Sharim neighborhood in Jerusalem. They call themselves Palestinians. Because the, that's the myth to squash where people think that. Oh, sorry, I can't go on, hear Mark. you, Mark. You're... Isn't there a, a a pretty large Samaritan Samaritan community also in 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 Gaza? Oh yes, yes, yes the Samaritan Palestinians. Yeah, they have you know Palestinian documentation. I mm -hmm. interviewed them. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah um, because it's there. a myth that like all the Jewish people left in the Exodus. Like that's like a really big myth. We should squash. Yeah, that was only the uh, the intelligentsia and the urban intelligentsia that were taken to Babylon because they were useful to the regime there, to work as scribes or or traders or or accountants or whatever. You know, they usually put uh, Jewish slaves to do. So, um, so here we are. We come from all these different places, and we have a convergence of thought yes. and, and analysis. You know, that's why we call ourselves a convergence. This is the principle, this is the idea, and we're something new. Because, you know, uh, this is not, you know, like a political party where I'm the leader and tell you what to think. In effect, you know, like we have council meetings like this. And a council meeting decides, you know, what positions to take, what positions we can't take, what positions we would like to take but can't take, you know, whatever. You know, like it all gets decided in council and not by, and not in secret. Yeah. So, Can I be honest about something? Nice. Very nice, I think. So we have a convergence of various tendencies as a result, not just individuals and not just, you know, individual activists and thinkers and bloggers, you know, from various parts of the world. No. <clears throat> We're also a convergence of, uh, well, I start off with Bundism. And then that corresponds to the Black National Liberation Movement because the same principle of the self-determination of a national minority within a given society, civil society, forget about the state. Then we have Maoists, 
do we have any anarchists? <laughs> we have third worldists, and we have Maoists, third worldists, and we have Mark, <laughs> who has oh, yes. <laughs> Mark, who has the uh, Institute of Dialectical Materialism. No, which, dialectical, dialectical metarealism. Metarealism, meta which represents what current of thought? I haven't figured that uh, out yet. Roy Baskar's critical realism combined with Maoism and third worldism. Nice. Ah, uh, okay. Roy was a magnificent guy, and he basically, he, he, he was a Marxist-Leninist, but he took Marxism-Leninism and then in the last decade of his life spiritualized it, and he called that the philosophy of metareality, the original philosophy was critical realism. So what I did is I took the second turn that Roy had, which was dialectical critical realism, and I combined it with the philosophy of meta reality, and that's how I coined dialectical meta realism. And uh -huh. it, it turned out that it it's a pun on dialectical materialism, but that was unintentional. Uh -huh. Yes, and you've done a number of lectures uh, in like a academic. Uh course uh, kind of uh, a way so you've got that archive you know very good work i, I present this I, I presented it to my students until before i retired mm. and i have a, a lot of podcast episodes on it as well mm. uh, you're lucky to be able to have uh, continued to to teach i taught at uh, york university in toronto in 1978 79 80 81 and then i got called to work in the palestinian embassy in ottawa during the war of uh, 1982 to 1985. And then ever since then, you know, whenever I applied, you know, to teach again, I now, I and got no reply, none whatsoever, totally sort of, you know, disappeared from, from reality. As you've, done, you've done more than 10 men in your life. So who cares? Yeah. 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 I've got another couple of, of uh, decades to go here. Yes. And, uh, yeah, I got uh, my one knee is fixed now. You know, it doesn't hurt anymore. It works. Mm -hmm. So that's taken care of. Now I've got the other knee to do, good, so I'm sure I'm going to be able to take care of that, you know, as I've done the first, and then I'm going to be ready oh, to go yeah. back to Nablus. Yeah. Good. No pain at all anymore. That's great. Imagine, you know, like if I were in Nablus and we were doing this, you know, like we can do this, you know, oh, and I can you give know, you direct reports from inside, you know, Palestine. Oh, yeah. I'd have oh, to, like... It would be the lifelong dream to at the least come visit you in that. And then we're setting up a guest house. So you're all invited, you know, like, you, you know, you, we've got to get you into Palestine to come and see, you know, like what we're doing. And then we'll go out, you know, for a demonstration. I'm not, I'm not sure <laughs> if it would let me in. Uh, they would, they would let have me? to. They would give you, you know, like, they would, if they were to discriminate against you, they would, you know, cut down on the duration of your visa because normal visa, you know, like that they give everybody when they come in, you know, is three months. Then they would give you a visa for maybe one month. Depends on how you answer their interrogation. They would interrogate you, of course, everyone. <laughs> and yeah. then they either give you a visa for one month or one week. And then, you know, in order to sort of not be embarrassed by having to deport you and explain why. And then there you can have an appeal, you know, if they want to deport you, you can appeal to a court, you know, so they don't want to do that. You're, you're asking autistic people to be like cordial and nice with the Zionists so they'll let us in friendly. <laughs> you know how difficult that is? Like, I gotta be like, don't call him a fucking Nazi. Don't call him a fucking Nazi. Don't call him a Nazi. <laughs> Hi, Heinrich. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Nazis, yeah. uh, one thing yeah. I've noticed about certain communists is that after the genocide in Gaza started, a lot, some of my left-wing Facebook friends turned into what are called national Bolshevists or Nazbols. Uh, yeah. Anti-Semitic fucking wankers. They don't care for Palestine. They just want to push the fucking fascist agenda. Are they actually called Nazbols? Yeah. Well, no, is that term... Um, uh, would um, you say that term applies to uh, a character like Caleb Moped, you know, who supports Trump? Yes. Yeah, yes, yes. Caleb, Caleb Morpin is like the archetypical American Nazbol. Ah, okay. Definitely Nazbol. I couldn't know. believe it. I didn't believe, you know. I saw, I heard him, you know, many times on, you know, Russia Today, you know, giving, you know, like left-wing kind of reports and commentary. And then it's all of a sudden, one time, he just of. comes up with this thing, you know, like about, you know, about Trump, you know, like, not just, you know, like, talking oh, about how it's likely Trump. he may be elected, you know, but 
favoring his election as well, you know, like he's you know, going what? to stick it to the corporations as a leader of a corporation himself. Actually, several corporations because he's a billionaire. But like, oh, okay, you know, yeah, well, sure, you replace all the corporations with one corporation. That solves the problem. <laughs> I mean, would well, that not be the, the ultimate socialist billionaire plan? Oh, sorry, Mark. No, I'm saying Caleb uh, uh, loves Trump and, and despises me. He li literally despises me, and I, I'm not. I, and it's only because I, I, I one time uh, agreed with a statement that uh, Jason Unruh made against Caleb, and I, and I made a comment saying I agreed. Well, of course, with oh yeah, you were a traitor. Yeah, you know, and and, ba and based and based upon that, uh, that that was the end. But you know, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. <laughs> you know, a minor thing, but uh, you know, and, and and you know, and Caleb and Jason were friends at one point, but then then Jason realized Caleb's true colors, and that ended. Um, it took him long enough. I was trying to tell Jason Caleb was a fascist for about a couple of years. By the time he woke up, uh, it was uh, a really yeah. stressful situation because he just deafened himself when I was trying to tell him, like. Mm. It's like, God damn, like, uh, you know, you can't ignore this kind of information when it's being given to you. you got to see it through, even if you don't agree with it. But you know how he's, like, got that weird, like, hate boner for you for no reason? Um, I criticized him for making a position on ethnostates. Now, he'd already got pissy with me because I, like, I tried to, like, be, like, quasi-nice about him. used to being a more radical person as a way to be like, what the fuck's this, Caleb? But I did another video on him, and I was at a campfire because um, I was with my mate and was homeless. Um, we were out in the woods, and I decided to make a criticism video. It was like, um, what about ism on ethnostates? And because uh, I was like really obviously smoking weed by the campfire, um, he started like ranting about hippies smoking weed in the woods, like when he would get angry about people. And I think that was because of me. You mean Caleb? <laughs> Probably. Wow. Well, I mean, it, it, Caleb, Caleb is basically he's an opportunist, but he's but he's also a Putinist. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, he works for Russia today. That's his job. Uh, he, he's 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 an American correspondent with RT News. Yeah. So I mean, he basically says whatever. I, I don't know how much direction he's given by by the Kremlin, but he, but but he can't deviate too much from it. I would uh, say that he chooses to be a sycophant, you know, because I've yes. seen you know like various journalists on Russia Today who are critical of even Putin, you know. And the thing but, is, is that the they, most popular, they, he oh, doesn't, sorry. he doesn't Caleb do any critical not. work whatsoever. You know, yeah. I've seen, you know, Russia Today journalists, you know, at the beginning of the war in uh, Ukraine, talked about the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, you know, and the they use that type is, of terminology in a, in a sort of a, a critical fashion. And yet, you know, nothing happened to them. The thing <laughs> is, though, is that what they do instead is they make the ones who are more pro-Russia more popular. So, like, people like Caleb, who is a sycophant, he's, like, really, really popular with the team. Well, people who are more critical, they're kind of mm -hmm. shunned by the more, like, mainstay guys that are really, like, Russia first and don't think uh -huh. of it any other way. Well, yes, I, but, I, I mean, sorry, I, they Andrew, don't get though, Andrew wanted to say I, something. You know, but... like, what I'm, the point I'm making, you know, like, to conclude yeah. is that Caleb, he could be critical. He could be more critical, but he chooses not to be. Oh, well, I, I agree I, with you, yeah. I, I, I think the I think the reason why he's made that choice is because he he, he basically has n no no educational background no occupational background. I mean, mm. that, I mean he, he he was he's lucky that he got that job working for RT, but he has no training, no experience working in anything else. What I academic mean, qualifications um, does he have, if any? I would definitely define him as a right wing opportunist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he grew up in Iowa, moved to New York in search of the better life, and uh, didn't know what he was going to do. Mm -hmm. And then he, he he kind of fell into this uh, this this working working with RT, and and developed his own institute. Then he was he he he, he got into trouble because of that uh, of, of as as Jason calls him Spanky the Tanky because he was uh, <laughs> uh, 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 hiring. Uh, these women who worked for his institute uh, to uh, spank him. What? He, he took, yeah. he took a, a, I'm not sure, six months, a year leave of absence, uh, and he, he, he totally shut down most of his social media. Um, and then he came back, 
And he's pretty much doing the same thing, but he turns over control of the Institute to other people. Because he, he's like 10 look. hours of videos worth of commentary on this guy that, about this scandal. Um, uh, well, he's uh, still the ideological head. Well, he's just well, like he's pushed off. Ideological head, right. That's what it's called. Yeah, about. yeah. But um, I, one thing I want to say about him, like uh, some of that happened that was kind of interesting. So anyone who knows Jason long enough and watching his channel long enough will know he had that job at the gas station. Yes. Um, Caleb, when trying to condescend to the lumpen proletariat and specifically black people, he wasn't even hiding the way America just kind of perceives lumpen proles as black. So I'm trying to push it as a petty bourgeois class as something that should be telling. Um, he, uh, what's it? Um, he... Uh, goes on about working at a gas station when another time when he was trying to flaunt how much of a working class person he was all he could come up with to combat port slime was a summer holiday uh, of uh, like a, a burger like a sandwich shop and so i'm like why wouldn't he have mentioned this like rugged lower class area gas station that happened to have a lot of black people living in the area? Yeah, um, no, no, that's that, the way he put it. Why wouldn't he mention that? That, 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 is, that is not his background. He 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 he, he comes from an all white community in Iowa. E exactly. Iowa. So like, why wouldn't he have mentioned that hard working lower class area that he worked in, or, or like when he was like trying to flaunt with Fort Slime? But as soon as he's trying to like condescend to black people he's like i've worked in your areas i know yeah. what you lump and proletarians are like it's like fuck mm. caleb take your kate take your clansman mm. hood off mm. you're, you're on the internet <laughs> i'm a London proletarian background myself and uh, that's one reason i don't care much for spanky the tanky <laughs> my god you know he tried to tell me i don't know what my class is and tell me i'm just a proletarian and i'm like okay lumber proletarians are proletarians no shit it's in the fucking name but like a trip a real trip but what about some other uh major uh personalities like uh i have respect Pause. for max blumenthal Mm -hmm. Oh, Max uh, Blumenthal's a little shit, though. At the same time, what his politics is. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about him. You know, like what his, you know, political sort of um, history and experience is. He's known for being like a, a, a right, like, uh, like, um, what's the word for it? Like evangelist for like the bullshit that we've seen from the Venezuela administration. You know, like condoning they're wanting to start a war with fucking um, Guyana and like, uh -huh. oh uh, yeah, yeah, I know, but that's and been... they're condoning their oil industry and shit like that. You know, some of me and you have both criticized about how they kind yeah. of just became a little like outlet for imperialists rather than actually de-imperializing de their uh, industry. Yeah, um, yeah they're selling to the United him. States now as well. Well, yeah, because the United States is the ultimate evil until they offer you a good deal. <laughs> yeah. I heard a couple months ago that Venezuela wanted to attack, not attack, but maybe invade or annex parts of... Uh, their western neighbor of their Guyana, yeah, because uh, disputed territory in the middle of there, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. It, but they're it, it, they're not supposed to be separate states in the first place. The Bolivarian Revolution was supposed to be a federation of all the nationalities of South America together. To be fair, though, it, like Venezuela has part of Guyana, not the other way around, really. If you think about the ethnic, like, like oh, sort of according to the ethnology sort of, of it, yeah. Uh -huh. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So it's like realistically, it's like kind of back asswards the way it's going on. Because for a federation to survive, you have to kind of respect the boundaries of the people in that federation. And Venezuela's kind mm. of been a bit like Colombia in that regards, not respected mm. it all too well. Mm. Um, which kind of sucks because Venezuela was one of the big center play like places of the Bolivia and revolution. Like I, yeah. I mean, the actual um, like Bolivar himself, like you know mm -hmm. that revolutionary movement, not the. Whatever the fuck Maduro thinks he's calling. Yeah, Bolivar. yeah, like every, you know, like uh, you know, half the politicians, you know, consider themselves to be Bolivar. <laughs> God damn, everyone's got their little hero complex. It's like how yeah. everyone wants to be Stalin when they become a Marxist-Leninist. I'm like, you guys need yes, to stop yes, being yes, fringe yes, and yes, chill yes, the yes. fuck out. Like, <laughs> yes, I've noticed. I've noticed. <laughs> I was unironically a Stalinist when I became a Marxist-Leninist at first, and it's kind of cringe to think about. Like, he did some good things, but it's kind of too dogmatic, you know? Well, he wasn't educated politically, you know? Like, Lenin was educated as a lawyer. You know, he came from practically 
you know, he was upper middle class family. You know, he had a really excellent education. It was you know, actually a bit but rockier Stalin than that. Stalin only had a clerical education. He was going through a seminary. He didn't have any political education. So while Lenin did have a higher education, his family had only just secured that. His father actually was originally born a peasant, and he had like oh. worked his way, like like basically by force. That guy went from being a teacher to a headmaster to the fucking head of the entire school system of Tsarist Russia. Like, wow. it, like Lenin's father himself is a fucking like monster when it comes to getting shit done. Like love and respect for that man. And you can wow. see how him, his mother, and his brother were like math and his sister, sorry, were massive influences on Lenin's revolutionary pathway. As well as I remember the Marxist I was trying to think of the other day, Plekhanov. Uh -huh. Yeah, Plekhanov was a really big inspiration for Lenin as well. He yeah. was the he was what who should have been the most important Marxist alive instead of Kortsky, you know, like the biggest I don't think we should ever judge like that, but if you're gonna fucking operate like that, I can't believe Kortsky was seen as better than Plekhanov. Even mm -hmm. Engels said Plekhanov was like ahead of the curve that yeah, Plekhanov Kortsky was just more orthodox. Yeah. Yeah, and orthodox Marxism was something Engels actually called um, revisionists, basically. Like, they, they're mm. the original revisionists, because um, uh, I differentiate. You have, like, traditional Marxism, which would just be, like, Marxism with no hyphenations. And then mm. you have, um, like, orthodox Marxism is that weird revisionist shit that, like, uh, Marx was criticizing in Critique of the Gotha Program and a few other stuff, where yeah. it's, like, literally not even Marxism. It uh. just acts like it's orthodox to the 1848 script which yeah that's exactly you know what the social democrats are the social democrats are marxists also the second Depends international is marxist about. international but <laughs> essentially you know the social democratic parties are marxists even though the ndp of canada voted to remove the word socialism from its charter <laughs> yeah there, there's new forms of social democracy that aren't that way either though uh, social but, Mark, we can't hear you. You're, you're, oh, sorry. you're... Uh, 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 Rosa Luxemburg, of course, called herself uh, a social democrat, but that was in a much different time. These days, I mean, like there was a big split um, about 110 years ago between the social democrats and the democratic socialists. Social democrats basically were basically capitalist revisionists. Yeah. And democratic socialists basically w wanted to elect socialism without revolution although these um, days democratic socialists support revolution so it's kind of confusing there was also the uh, second party uh, congress of the rsdlp which led to the uh, bolshevik menshevik split no um, it was a bolshevik bundes split oh uh, really yes. yes it started off that's how it started off is but kara had his had her hand up you know so you have yeah. priority um, I just wanted to ask about, can we get in a quote that will explain the whole social democratic conundrum um, quickly? It's not, it's not too long. Um, well, social democracy, had, it's, it's, like, it's like any other name, and it. it's changed in, in, in its usage. Back during, back during Red Rose's time, it was, it, it, it was basically a reference to revolutionary socialism or, or communism. Then it was kind of, it, it was abandoned. Uh, that term and it was picked up by by basically some I guess you could say right wing democratic socialists who basically wanted to keep capitalism uh, but make some reforms kind kind of like uh, uh, New Deal. Okay, but let me let me interject here. You know, you know, like paradoxical as it may seem. You know, the Iskra group, you know, of Lenin, the Leninists were part of the Social Democratic Party of Russia. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the Social Democratic Party of Russia was a federated party, which included the Jewish Bund. Oh. Then, in 1903, at the International Congress, when the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks voted to expel the Bund, you know, they will say that the Bund, you know, quit. It's not true. The Bund put forward a motion calling for recognition as a Bund, and it was rejected, even though they should have had more votes because they had more members. It was rejected, and so they left, you know, because their recognition was denied. Then the Russian Social Democratic Party split as well in corresponding, you know, to the international. And that's when the Communist Party started after it split from the Bolsheviks. Uh, uh, so, sorry, after it split from the Bundes yeah. in the Russian Social Democratic Party. Okay. What's it? Right. So this quote actually explains a lot. If I just go on slightly for a bit, um, I'll be quick with it. 
Um, Very good. But if the Trotskyist trend represents a quote-unquote left deviation, does this mean that the quote-unquote lefts are more to the left than Leninism? No, it does not. Leninism is the most left, without quotation marks, trend in the world labor movement. We Leninists belong to the Second International, to the, uh, uh, down to the outbreak of the imperialist war, as the extreme left group of the Social Democrats. We did not remain in the Second International, and we advocated a split in the Second International precisely because, being the extreme left group, we did not want to be in the same party as the petty bourgeois traitors to Marxism, the social pacifists and social chauvinists. It was these tactics and the, this ideology that subsequently became the basis of all the Bolshevik parties of the world. In our party, we Leninists are the sole lefts without quotation marks. Consequently, we Leninists are neither quote-unquote lefts nor rights in our own party. We are a party of Marxist-Leninists, and within our party, we combat not only those who we call openly opportunist deviators, but those who pretend to be the to be quote-unquote lefter than Marxism, quote-unquote quote, lefter than Leninism, and to camouflage their right opportunist nature with high-sounding sound, high sounding left phrases. Um, everyone realizes that when people who have not yet rid themselves of Trotskyist trends are called, quote-unquote, lefts, it is meant ironically. Lenin referred to the, quote, left communists, end quote, as lefts sometimes with and sometimes without quotation marks, but everyone realizes that Lenin called them lefts ironically thereby emphasizing that they were lefts in words and appearance, but that in reality they represented petty bourgeois right trends. But what guarantees that the, uh, is there that the quote-unquote lefts and the rights will not find each other again? Laughter. Obviously there is not and cannot be any guarantee of that, but if we uphold the slogan of a fight on two fronts, does that does this mean that we are proclaiming the necessity of centrism in our party? What does a fight on two fronts mean? Is this not centrism? You know, that's the that that is exactly what the, the Trotskyists to pick matter. There are the the lefts. That is we, the Trotskyists, the real Leninists. There are the rights. That is all the rest. And lastly, there are the centrists who vacillate between the lefts and rights. Can that be considered a correct view of our party? Obviously not. Only people who have become confused in all their concepts and who have long ago broken with Marxism can say that. It can be said, it, it can be said only by people who fail to understand the difference in, in principle between the Social Democratic Party of the pre-war period, which was the party of a bloc of proletarian and petty bourgeois interests, and the Communist Party, which is the monolithic party of the revolutionary proletariat. Centrism must not be regarded as a spatial concept. The right say sitting on one side, the left, the quote unquote lefts on the other, and the centrists in between. Right, centrism is a political concept. Its ideology is one of adaptation, of subordination, of the interests of the proletariat to the interests of the petty bourgeoisie within one common party. This ideology is alien and abhorrent to Leninism. Centrism was a phenomenon that was natural in the Second International of the period before the war. There were rights, the majority, lefts without quotation marks, and centrists whose whose whole policy is embellishing the opportunism of the rights with left phrases and subordinating the lefts to the rights. Sorry, that was a long one, but you see it kind of goes through like a really big portion of it that shows that the you Social didn't Democrats... Say you didn't tell us where it came from. The, the, Where's that uh, from? One second, one second, one second, one second. One second. The, I, I, I will say, I will say, I will say, just let me finish this part. That the Social Democrats of today are actually still the continuation of the Social Democrats of yesterday. A unification of petty bourgeois and proletarian interests. This is from Stalin. Um, oh, now we know. <laughs> okay. Uh, industrialization okay, yeah, of the country and the right deviation of the CPSU 1928. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, no, I, come on, uh, Mark, you got to stick with the microphone, you know, be microphone I, you conscious. Know, I, 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 we need to glue it to yeah, you. Sorry, this, this mic is, uh, is, very, is very sound sensitive and it does that so it doesn't pick up background noise. Yeah. But um, the uh, it, however much I may agree with that, it's so triumphalistic. And I, I, I just despise triumphalism. I mean, I think you know, I think most academics don't like triumphalism. I don't see what you mean by triumphalistic in this well, in regard. Words, basically, tri triumphalism is basically saying we're right and we will succeed uh, against all all the forces arrayed against us. 
Yeah, that's right, not maybe. what he's trying to say. He's trying to say that, like, as the Marxist Leninists, we are the left, and to be principal Marxist Leninists, we must be the most left I because the most that. left is the most progressive point I'm forward. Like, he's yes. not. He's not. He's not saying that they're not point to falter because Stalin was very big on the idea that you need to purge the party of like petty bourgeois percolation, which is kind of the thing he's warning about here. Uh, that's why he's mentioning Trotsky. Um, he's saying the Leninists in the party represent the left because to be a Leninist, you need to be the left and that anyone who's trying to push a right position are betraying the party's principles by being right deviation. Oh, yeah, he goes into that as well. Yes. But uh, 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 his comments on the Social de Democrats, you know, I consider to be correct. They're, they're but, very, uh, very interesting uh, when you look at it, because it's like, yeah, the Social Democrats was this weird hodgepodge of the petty bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Yeah. And that's still that's how it operates today. Yeah, you know, I got expelled from the Social Democratic yeah. Party a long time ago. I was expelled from the NDP in 1970, would you believe, because of my talk on Palestine. They didn't want to have anything to do with me there. You know, like, and then, you, know, you know who initiated my expulsion from the Social Democratic Party? It was the members of the Communist Party youth who had infiltrated the Social Democratic Party who initiated my expulsion, and the leadership went along with it. I was wondering, as someone with a Marxist-Leninist background in a who I'm also very interested and optimistic when it comes to Bundism, if there are any uh, like cooperation or ideological similarities between the two. Between what? Bundism and Marxism, Leninism. I mean, and Bundism. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, interesting. Uh, it, it, of course, you know the Bundists. You know, came out of the Marxists. You know era of the 19th century yes but in 1897 when the bund was founded it was just you know like like people like you you know like <laughs> even younger than you you know like 21 22 23 year olds who founded the bund and yeah, the zionists so you know were the um, middle class you know middle-aged uh, uh jewish representatives basically who had the legitimacy and and the, the resources uh, to uh, to launch an organization. Yeah, the yeah. Bundes movement sprouted out of the uh, the secular movement in, in the Jewish community. Um, no. Uh, well, it, 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 it ties to, to it. It depends it just, what you call secular, you know, like they're from the intelligentsia. I, I mean, within the context of Judaism itself, I don't mean sort of generally secular. I mean, okay, sort they, of were, like, they weren't Hasidim. Yeah, they weren't Hasidim. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, um, yeah. uh, we're not getting into Helena, Helenaism at this point. <laughs> yeah. well, well, you know, my grandfather, what, my grandfather was a Hasid. Oh, wait, what are you saying, Mark? What dynasty? Oh, what um, dynasty? I was thinking of like... Um, what, dyna I, what dynasty was your grandfather in? Do you know? Oh, sorry. Oh, my, my grandfather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you mean dynasty? Or you well, mean what like, sect? Well, well, like Lubavitcher, uh, Breslov. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. He wasn't a Galiziana. No, no. He he lived in a shtetl called uh, called Breslau, just uh, outside of Lublin in southern Poland. That was sometimes part of Ukraine. Breslau. Sometimes part of the Romania. You know, so uh, you know that village doesn't exist anymore. I tried to find it on Google Maps. You know, but it's it's gone, gone forever. And uh, there was a big center point of uh, Nazi like experimental operations. Breslau was they were doing a lot of crazy shit under the ground with like experimental weapons and using Jewish slaves to to do so. Of course. Oh wait a second. Uh, uh, Breslau is is in Germany. Um, this is uh, this is in Poland. Um, uh, they they renamed it into Breslau um, when they took over it. Uh, uh -huh. so, uh, okay. Well, a lot of people who are who follow it now. They, oh, sorry. Modified the pronunciation to Bratslav. Bratslav. So yeah, course, that would be yes. more in line with how you would pronounce that kind of place in Polish as well. Anyway, just because of yeah. the way. And sometimes oh, it's a uh, pronounce a so uh, Yeah, that's in Germany. That's in Western Germany. That's where my parents were in a refugee camp. Oh, oh you're on about a different place. Sorry, I'm getting. I'm confused. talking about Bialki. <laughs> Bialki is the name of the shtetl. I may, I mix it up with the refugee okay, camp. Okay, no, name. okay, no. I'm getting. Yeah, I'm thinking of like West Poland. <laughs> uh, 
No, I don't Bianchi know was the I, like, I, I can't remember what its Polish name is because Breslau was what it was called when the the Nazis took over. I can't think of the Polish name. Ah, by, uh-huh. by, by, by dynasty, uh, I, I'm, I'm using a, a translation of the Hebrew word uh, shoshalet. Ah. If that, if that, makes any, if that rings any bells. That's the no. original Hebrew word that's translated dynasty, uh-huh. shoshalet. So, but, um, you know, the, the question of triumphalism, I wanted to comment upon that, you know, because, you know, you're criticizing the triumphalism yeah. of Stalin's remarks. I understand that, you know. You know, and there's always, you know, these political reports that end up with, you know, the wonderful conclusion that we're yeah. on the right path and we will win, et cetera, et cetera. And we just have to keep on doing the same thing oh, and everything Graham will be okay. Okay. Now, this triumphalism, you know, is obviously uh, uh, demagogic and didn't work and uh, is this, you know, uh, obviates the need for discussion and debate and disagreement. Yeah. So it's fundamentally flawed as a methodology and it's bound to fail. But, <laughs> but I feel triumphalist about the Bund, you know, like in its fight, you know, with the, uh, with Zionism. I mean, even though Zionism is so strong and everything, I feel like the Bund is going to uh, carry out a Jewish revolution and overthrow the Zionist regime, both I'm inside Palestine and here that. and everywhere. Yes, Kara. Um, this is really short from Gramsci, and I think you'll really like this one, Mark. Um, the yes. determinist fatalist element has been an immediate ideological quote-unquote aroma of the philosophy of praxis, a form of religion and a stimulant, but like a drug, uh, necessitated and historically justified by the sub- quote-unquote subordinate character of certain social strata, which mm-hmm. one does not have the initiative in the struggle, and the struggle itself is ultimately identified um uh, with a series of defeats, mechanical determinism becomes a formidable power of moral resistance, of cohesion, and of patient and obstin- obstinate perseverance. Quote, I am defeated for the moment, but the nature of things on my side is on my side in the long run, end quote, etc. Real will is disguised as an act of faith. And sure rationality of history, a, primi- uh, a primitive and empirical form of impassioned finalism, which appears as a, support, a substitute for the predestination, providence, etc., of the confession relig- of the confessional religions. We must insist on the fact that even in such <laughs> cases, there exists in reality a strong active will. We must stress the fact that fatalism has only been a cover by the weak for an active and real will. This is why it is always necessary to show the futility of mechanical determinism, which, explicable as a naive philosophy of the masses, becomes a cause of passivity, of imbecilic self-sufficiency, which it is made and onto made into a reflexive and co- coherent philosophy. Almost sounds like Nietzsche. The intellectuals and uh-huh. yeah, yeah, like, Nietzsche like, and the like, the like, essence, like, of, you know, yeah, the, the essential will. nature of the will. Yeah. yeah, will as the determinant, the historical determinant. Yeah. And I must clarify of Gramsci, when he mentions intellectuals, he doesn't mean like highfalutin in any sense. He's he's being coy when he talks shit on intellectuals. He, a lot of the time, um, you know, uh, it's like he, he'll specify a lot of the time when he's talking about traditional intellectuals. But when he's generally speaking, like in this one, like um, I was talking about needing to make a, a, a coherent philosophy on the part of the, the um, you know, the intellectuals, like... That is a recursivity of criticism of the petty bourgeois chauvinists, but actually respect for the proletarian intellectuals, because a very big thing to take in when you read Gramsci is everyone is an intellectual. If you don't come in thinking like that, you're going to read Gramsci upside down, wrong, bass backwards, like the neo-Marxists did. Everyone can be an intellectual, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah everyone phenomenon... thinks it. Yes. Anybody. Yeah. anybody. And and there's a phenomenon here in Quebec, you know, with respect to the student population, I'd like to mention, which is indicative of this as well. You know, in Ontario, the only 10% of the student population come from working class. Okay. So empirically, you know, some jerk will say, oh, well, the working class are the working class because they're less intelligent. You know, it's their own fault that they're with the working class. I However, like poor as shit. Yeah. Here in Quebec, where the tuition fees are much lower, ha ha. 
the percentage of the working class amongst the student body is 20%, twice as much as in Ontario, <laughs> because the tuitions fees, you know, are, are about half of what they are in Ontario, you know, so yeah, correspond, direct correspondence, you know, like uh, in terms of accessibility. Yeah. Because it's so, free in Scotland, like you get just a lot more people going. What do you mean? Going university, to university, you don't pay, you don't pay, you don't pay tuition fees in Scotland. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So many countries, you know, don't have tuition fees, you know. In Algeria, yeah, yeah. Like England my roommate tells me that they even pay though. students to go to university. You know, tuition they pay them a student fees. stipend. Yes, Andrew. Tuition fees are very high here in America, but uh, one book in particular, I will say, that had a huge influence on my uh, political ideology is this, uh, Stalin, The Collected Works, Volume 1 by Iskra Books. Ah. Hmm. Yeah, it includes books from 1902 to 1906. Oh, interesting! Most just, interesting uh, period. Uh, 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 at tuition is New York State. In New York State, you, you can get a bachelor's degree with no no tuition if you're a New York State resident. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, how how do you... Has that? Uh, it, it's basically picking up where California left. It used to be true you could do that in California. But that, that ended about 30 years ago. But now you can do, do that in uh, New York State. Wow. Free tuition for a bachelor's degree wow. for all New York State residents. Well, I think that, uh, that both uh, Andrew and, and Cara are examples uh, of uh, how individuals can be intellectuals, you know, without having to or having access to a university. And someone asked can, me if uh, I was private schooled, and I'm like, no, I was street schooled. <laughs> yeah. It was that uh, it was that brother I was going out for a meal with because he comes from a more middle middle upper middle class background. He's like in politics and stuff. And um he uh he was like uh yo, are you private school? Because you know like way too much about like history and culture and like <laughs> fucking politics for someone who's twenty five. And I'm like, no, I just it's just what I do. Like, I, yeah, but, you study yourself. You teach yourself. Yeah, you have the I've will. Been, I've been studying the way the world works around me ever since I was young. Because fuck me, like, you go for enough car rides, you're gonna want to think about all those things you're seeing outside the window and how they're functioning. You go for enough walks, you hear enough conversations, and you just build up from there. It's that kind of constant amalgamation mm -hmm. of how do these things work? Yeah, uh, what is the phenomena associated with them? In order to. Mm -hmm. to which is uh, no, yeah, come no, 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 Mark. You have to start over again, and you have to speak into. The no, microphone. I said that's like that, that. That that's like saying that, which I think is correct, that you're an autodidact. Um, as as for example, uh, uh, is is Jason right now? So he starts his psychology education, uh, as was Albert Einstein, uh, an, an autodidact. Uh, so so yeah, I mean, some of the, of the most brilliant. Um, inventors, scientists, educators in the world have been entirely self-taught. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a question, uh, it's a matter of will. Mm -hmm. As Nietzsche said, you know, <laughs> to quote, yeah. you know, give his due, you know, it's will, a matter of will. Right. If you will yourself to be an intellectual, you can be an intellectual because of curiosity, because of necessity, because of your understanding that you can play a role and that nobody else can and nobody else will. And so you have to do it. All that sort of stuff comes into it. Yeah. There's also a thing as well that like roles can be pretty minor. Like being an intellectual necessarily isn't actually that massive of a barrier. Cause if you can tell, if you can talk to me for six hours about the different states of fucking tires, I would like respect you as an intellectual on tires that I would honor like your intellectual studies in tires. And you know what I mean? It sounds goofy and silly, but that is an intellectual. And by gosh, six hours on tires, that's a lot of tire knowledge. Slaps Papa tires. You'll be surprised how much brain power I can shove in one of these babies. <laughs> if I may uh, continue about the war in Gaza and yeah. imperialism in general, my brother actually worked for a company called AES that made explosive devices for the U.S. military. Yeah, AES systems. Mm -hmm. I know the one. That's where the uh, the serious uh, revolutionary option lies, you know, in the workers in those industries who can stop the production. They can assist upon conversion to uh, 
social needs. Yeah, that can happen. That will happen. Yeah. These but <laughs> otherwise, you know, the encampments and the protests should be directed against those factories and those companies. Mm -hmm. They should. He uh, was one of. He was one of the less uh, enlightened ones. He he said how he wanted to make bombs that were shipped to the Middle East so they could blow up what he called Arabs. Mm. If he said that, he said that yeah. your brother. He did say that. Wow. Wait, sorry, I was a bit gone out. What, do you mind repeating that, please? This is a, a this is a you know fact war production factory that his brother was uh, was involved with. Arabs. Arabs of all. That, uh, did, did he realize that he was using an offensive term? Or was that just how he pronounced Arabs? He knew what he was saying. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because like usually the mispronunciation is uh, like Arabs or uh, Arabs. So I can't do the American accent right now. Anyway, but you know, it's usually yeah, an over that. Okay. The Arab, that's that's a that's a slur. That is like when you draw not, when you not, put not, that space. Not, not always, not always. I mean, it, it's the it's the space that I'm trying to. Yeah, sometimes it's an accent or pronunciation. No, yeah, okay. but usually you know what I'm saying is usually when they mispronounce it, it's, it's all in one word. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all no, it's yeah. all it's all no. What I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is there's two different ways. You have it where it's all together, where they are still putting an a, but there's they're they're like it's Arab, but like uh some or, or Arab, um, but sometimes they'll go a and then rab. They'll put a pace between it, and that's when they're trying to like put emphasis on that rab bit as a way to kind of like it, it's getting into the ragged like we know we know like we know yeah. we know but what's important here is that we have to direct you know the the protest movement and the students in particular and mark we don't hear you anyway oh, sorry. Is, I have an important point yeah, of we've got to you know focus on the cro the the, the 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 crucial you know problem which is the war production that the u.s is applying you know the zion there's, state with there's a big and issue it's with those the factories that should be taken on here in toronto in toronto you know during the seven seventies you know the the factory that was making the guidance system for the cruise missiles that were being used you know to plan an attack on the soviet union over the north pole by testing in canada that was being built in toronto and that factory we had you know a picket line every week there and and we then did a blockade of the of the road going into the factory and shut it down and then what happened is a group from british columbia called direct action came and blew away the front wall of that factory and that factory was shut down okay this is the thing is they're not doing enough like they're not they're, they're, it's like every three weeks sometimes and it's like that's not frequent enough you're tickling them you need to be there realistic we should be building encampments outside of there that's and right watch, the, watch they hit the news as the police start trying to crack skulls like we need to take the risk like yeah we might actually get our bones broken and might get arrested doing these things but we oh, should be very upset you know because that's you know very sensitive you know it's touching war production whoa that's the yeah, essence of the it, United it, States the, of America. The, it'd be the publicity the movement would need as well. A peaceful encampment gets beaten yeah. in by the police, you know, yeah. and it's like... It um, exposes but, them completely, yeah. But also the students, I've got a fucking bit of beef with the, what they got, what, what's going on there. They, 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 they get, like, offered to talk and they shut down their encampment. Oh, I'm just going to give up my power basis. You're going to have a discussion about it. Okay, well, maybe you will deep you know, defund from Israel. So I'm going to shut down my power. Don't worry about it. What do you <laughs> think the fucking schools are going to do? They're going to build fences around the fucker. Oh, except, <laughs> except when actually the university, my university, University de Quebec and Montréal, you know, the 60s Quebecois university that was founded, which is the only university's the political science department that will allow me to do a thesis, you know, from the whole country and all of North America is the only place that it will allow me to do the thesis. <laughs> it's it's the a revolutionary university, university in North America, Trey Park. So, you know, the encampment there, the student encampment, you know, won their demands. You know, the University Administrative Council voted unanimously to support BDS, okay? So what they've done now is that student movement has now moved on to the, to the case populaire. You know what that is? That's the government funding agency for investments of pension still funds, of all the unions and everything, and they invest in American war production, and they invest in you know in Israel Israeli war production factories as well, and so they're taking on you know the core problem now. Have they still got their encampment, or have they given yeah, it up? Yeah, just started. Yes, you know, yes. See, this is 
exactly what I mean. Like, you should keep your power basis. Like, I'm losing my shit. Aston fucking university shut theirs down. I'm like, why are you doing that? And they just like, stopped. They didn't continue you know, on. Because, huh. because, even because even if they're gonna de- divest, that's not the end of it. We've got a whole Palestine to liberate. Like these encampments yeah. should keep going on until the whole of the British institutions have quammed to it. Because every they should institution, every single institution. Yeah, but, is yeah. that, yeah, but is that going to work? Is that is that literal? Is that really going to work? To if you together chain with the resistance, yeah. If together you, if with you the Palestinian it, resistance, if, if, together with the Jewish revolution, yes. Just to say as well, work. if you chain link it all together. Yeah. Um, as well with like I mean, workers' strikes, as yes. well with as well with and, workers and, and, and marine as, workers blockade, as, refusing to load yeah, Israeli I, ships. I, I mean, and with Yemen, yeah, yeah. But I mean, considering I mean Israel, Israel being supported by the the most powerful military in the world, financed by the wealthiest country in the world. Uh, so I mean, would would the United States and Israel pay attention to a few encampments? I hope so. But that's well, I was trying to say more than just a few encampments. Like what I was trying to say was that you chain link these encampments together and then you also chain link them to proletarian worker struggle. There's already people saying that we need a national strike in the UK right now. So we amplify on that. And they don't, they, part of the national strike is to drop the eight billion funding that's been put forward for uh, Israel and Ukraine. Uh, uh, so, yes. Yeah. This yeah. uh, could be taken over by the Palestinian radicals and turn it into not only just that, but an absolute divestment and like yeah. push it like to the nth degree. We could push for divestment from Sudan as well. Why do we need to stop with Palestine? Because it's, yeah. this is the thing is people are stopping early with Palestine and it's like, whoa, we got a lot of struggle. We ain't going back to brunch yet, kiddos. Like yeah. this is the petty bourgeoisie leading the struggle again. The student movements... People need to stop framing students as just being proletarians to the professors. If the professors are bourgeois, the students are fucking petty bourgeois. That It's not like fucking high school. It, that makes more sense in high school that you're dealing with like a petty bourgeois, like even though the teacher's actually more a labor aristocrat with the fuck all they're getting paid. But the yeah. the actual social class dynamic within the confines of the school as a, as a social yeah. structure, um, they have a petty bourgeois relationship to the proletarian students in university is a lot more to the to adjacent to the professor than um like directly underneath them so there's uh, a relationship we have to understand of the difference between the lower and upper petty bourgeoisie and mm-hmm. why it's important that we organize with the lower petty bourgeoisie especially students do get fucked over a lot oh, but they, we also have to understand you're that, calling students uh, lower petty bourgeoisie no no well, i call they, them they are, unpaid I mean, workers I, I, I at the end of the day, if you're if you're if you're not if you're, if you're or, or, I, Mark, second, your microphone. But one I'm, second, I just. I'll, I'll forget, forget it. But to <laughs> give Kara the chance to conclude. I just I just want to say, if you're not working a job or you're also in university, then you definitely come from a background that's holding you a petty bourgeois existence. And like a lot of people that come from that working class background don't tend to actually get up in the upper class and if they do that's where they're going so university does project people to the petty bourgeoisie and that's kind of its job but sorry yes. mark you had an idea but students well, as I, such you know are not at that time you know that they are students you know part of the bourgeoisie even though well, they come from the petty bourgeoisie part, no, well, the, the, the lower petty bourgeoisie isn't the bourgeoisie like I, 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 that's why no, I mean, no, no, i'm lower, talking like, petty bourgeois you know like you no know, but the lower petty bourgeois shares students. relations with the labor aristocracy and the proletariat like because the petty bourgeoisie is an intermediary class so it's a yes. mess and amalgamation of different things. Well, coming from and going to are two other things, you know, but the state of being a student is a state in and of itself, you know, that is not... Uh, yes, but most students are petty bourgeois. I mean, they're they're actually, they're yes, about, they come from petty bourgeois and they have a petty bourgeois character, yes, but I'm talking about the category of student. No, but they, the, their existence, it's like, so if a, if a capitalist goes into education, do they become proletarian? What? But but the, but the students don't are not capitalists. They are no no no. But a petty bourgeois person. Capitalists. No, That's but a all. petty but a petty bourgeois person. Uh, but you're def- you are defined by the characteristics of where you come from. Like that's like, not, like he, that's material yeah, conditions. Not, not like like if you're if you're brought up bourgeois, are you going to have the culture of a proletariat or the culture of a bourgeois person? You're you're mixing up personal character and we're social defined, position. We're defined by no what no. We, I'm 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 sort of I'm I, no, I'm saying I, no. I'm not saying people couldn't betray that character. I'm saying what is the innate facet of how you would be raised? Like 
Okay, you know, yeah, like, I, like I mentioned, you know, that's, you know, before, you know, like uh, there's before, middle and after type thing. Yes, but, but I'm okay, trying to say that, like, say, okay, if, let's if, ask if, for Mark and Andrews, you know, like, law, but, on this. No, because the thing I was trying to explain is there are people mm. in universities Mark, that Mark, absolutely, Mark, no, listen, listen, Mark, listen, listen, Mark, listen, Mark, listen, Mark, listen, Mark, no, stop. Conclude, Cara, and then, and then just, Mark and then Andrew. Just, can you, can you stop, just, stop, Cara. Mark, can you stop, no. please? No, I will you not. You're talking over me. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. And then it's your turn and then Andrew's turn. What I'm trying to explain is that our people who are, can you, can you stop, Mark, please? You are being a dick. I'm. I'm not. I'm you not. Are, you are. I'm trying to like Mark, clear up my it's opinion. It's not your my turn. Position. It's not your turn yet. You're next. Okay. Finish. Conclude, Kara. So, like, what I was trying to say is there are people in universities who absolutely have to work a working class job to survive there. Yeah. There are your workers in university. Every other motherfucker is petty bourgeois. The exception does not outweigh the norm. And okay. the whole point of that environment is to be a very petty bourgeois environment. These people are in a weird yeah, we know. world we know. detracted yeah. from reality. It's that traditional intellectualism. Yeah, we know, we know, we know. Okay, Mark, what? Well, no, I, Mark, I, you know, use your microphone. Don't sit in a chair that you lean back. You know? yeah, was, Don't was, be so casual. You know, sit up front, you know. <laughs> okay, I, I, I was going to say, Kara, you're talking too much. You're talking too much. You just keep on talking. That's we're what having a thinking. fucking discussion. Sometimes people want to respond to an idea. That okay, so like, so you know, okay, but you know, talk about out, the topic. Mark, you know, what, you have something to say about you know Hold the character out. students or not? No. no. Okay, Andrew, Nothing. what do you have to say? Andrew, I stop was drinking. Wondering, yeah. Sorry, I was wondering as if as revolutionaries from Marxist Leninist to Bundist to uh. Bundist and Maoist third worldist. If we could build like an intercommunalist network of people from pantherist ideology to a uh, unionist, and we could possibly set up a network to disrupt the arms trade between Israel and the U.S. Yeah. Well, well that's we where should we have to go. In. That's the crucial problem. Yeah, and I think building. the convergence shows how you can work in the United Front. You know despite, you know, personal uh, conflicts. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, this is the way to go, you know, United Front strategy, you know, and that's a long time, you know, uh, you know, working class strategy that has existed, you know, since ages, but the political parties haven't learned as much. But in France right now, they have what they call the second Front Populaire against, you know, the rising, you know, right-wing fascist, you know, RN, Rassemblement National. And the latest polls indicate that they have like 37% support in the population, which is yes. more than what, you know, the party of Macron, the, the, the president has at this time, you know? So it's serious. But they don't say, you know, like how much support the left has. No, they just talk about, you know, the rising support of the right in the European elections, the rising support of the right in France, you know, they'll talk about, you know, they give publicity for the right wing, you know, in every country. That All they day can, long. But they never talk about Mélenchon. They never talk about the Second Front Populaire. No, 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 no. That doesn't make the news there. Huh. And it'll